Hallelujah. Anybody excited to be here on tonight? You know, I just feel a praise in my spirit. I've been a little anxious all day in a good way, but I just thank God for being here. I thank God for this opportunity. I thank God for my pastor and uh, First Lady for giving, giving me space to, to minister on this platform. It is truly an honor to, to sit before you, even in my own home, and, and just, just to minister to you what God has given me. And I uh, thank God. Um, first, I just want to thank God uh, for, uh, for Pastor and First Lady. I thank God for my best friend being here in town and uh, ministering the prayer. And, um, you know, we're just going to go ahead and jump right into the word. If you see me look away, I am trying to still look at screens and making sure everything is um, everything is okay. But um, I'm just so excited. I, I'm <laughs> There's an excitement in my spirit. I'm, I told Pastor when we first got on, I said, I am a little nervous. But I know that's a, it's, it's, it's okay to be nervous because it lets me know that, you know, I, I care about sitting before you and ministering to you what God has laid on my heart. So I ask that you all will continue to pray for me as we go forward. I just want to give honor to also to my husband and to uh, any family members that may be watching, to everyone in their respective places. So we're going to just jump right on in into the word of God. I hope you have your Bibles with you. We're going to be kind of all over the from front to back today um, talking about um seeking God and and the title for tonight's message and you know you guys might like this title the title for this message is what you're looking for and we're coming from the scriptures coming from Isaiah 55 verse 6 and Matthew 6 and 33 and I'm reading from the New Living Translation hallelujah it says seek the Lord while you can find him call upon him now while he is near and Matthew 6 and 33 says, <clears throat> seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything that you need. And I'm so, so thankful for this scripture title. It's called What You're Looking For. Um, I found myself a couple of weeks ago, um, right after Pastor made the announcement of who was speaking on what Wednesday. And I think a couple of days after that, I was up eating one of my midnight snacks because anybody who knows me knows that I like to have a bag of popcorn from time to time. And I thought I was going to have a bag of popcorn. I went and sat down at the table just about to make me some popcorn. And the Lord dropped this title in my spirit. And I was like, that's a Kirk Franklin song. I mean, for real, it's a Kirk Franklin song. But the Lord said, no, what are you looking for? And he gave me the scripture, Isaiah 55 and 6. And it says, seek the Lord while you can find him. Call upon him now while he is near. And to seek means to search or to desire something, to look for, to hunt. When was the last time you sought the Lord just because? When was the last time you sat at his feet just because you wanted to have some uninterrupted time with God? And, you know, I just find it, you know, so interesting that even in this pandemic, you know, sometimes we can get so busy with the things of life and not even take the time to seek God. Some of us miss God because we don't even seek him. We don't even search him out. Psalm 16 and 11 says, Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. And, you know, I'm just reminded, and I've, I've given this example before um, in teaching, that sometimes my dad will call me and he'll say, Oh, um, you know, he'll talk to me on the phone and we'll have good conversation. But... You know, he'll say, well, when are you coming by the house? And I say, oh, I'll, I'll be over there, you know, this weekend. And can I just tell you all, if I go over to the house, I stay for five minutes, I stay for two hours. Between my mom and my dad, they're always trying to give me something. I'm not even asking for it. I'm just over there communing. I'm just over there talking. We just over there laughing. We just over there having a good time. And before I get into my car, I got bags of stuff. I got bread. I got peanut butter. I got food. It's, I didn't even ask for it. It's, it. it's the exact same way when you're in the presence of God. It's, it's fullness of joy. If you don't have joy in your life, get into the presence of God. If you don't have peace in your life, get into the presence of God. If you don't know what to do, get into the presence of God. And it's at his right hand. You know, those things, you know, if, if anyone ever grew up with grandparents, grandparents are always, grandpas are always sticking their hands in their pocket, giving out a piece of candy to the little kids. They're pleasures forevermore, those sweet things in life that, that you didn't even know you even wanted. You didn't even know you wanted that little snicker that grandpa had. 
you know, in his pocket. You know, you didn't even know you even wanted that that lollipop that he had. But he just gave it to you because he loved you and you spent time with him and you hugged him and you loved on him. It's the same way when we're in the presence of God. So I'm here tonight to ask you what you're looking for. Don't don't get it twisted. Jesus knew about Job 14 and 1. He knew that man that is born of a woman is of a, f- of a few days and full of trouble. But I'm here to remind you tonight that Jesus is the answer. Amen. Mm-hmm. So you can just type that in underneath at the bottom of the screen that Jesus is the answer. So Matthew 11 and 28, and I'm coming from different versions of the Bible. So just please bear with me. I just went with how God gave it to me. Matthew 11 and 28 says, Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. And, and, you know, it's interesting because I think that Jesus knew that we needed him. If he, if we didn't need him, he wouldn't have asked us to come. He, he had to have known that we would have bouts of weariness, that we would carry heavy burdens and that we would need rest. Oh, you might be saying, Sister Farina, I'm good. You know, I've been on quarantine since March. I'm straight. No, let me tell you, before quarantine, I was weary. Okay, let me give you some definitions. So uh, being weary is feeling or showing tiredness, especially as a result of excessive exertion or lack of sleep. That was me. Yeah, lack of sleep. Yeah, tired. Yeah, wanting a break. I didn't know I was going to get a three-month break. I I had no idea. Amen? Uh, Okay, maybe you're not weary. Maybe you're burdened. A duty of misfortune that causes hardship, anxiety, depression, grief, things being a nuisance to you. That's, that, could, that can burden and weigh you down. But God says he's going to give you rest to cease from action or motion, to refrain from labor, physical and mental effort, things that weigh you down in your mind that you don't even, that you don't even talk about, things that, that weigh you down when you're driving. You don't, even how you, you don't even know how you got home. You know you drove home, but you don't even know how you got home because you got so much stuff in your mind. You got so many issues going on at your job. You got issues going on in your family. You got issues going on with your kids. Now, I know I may not have any physical kids, but sometimes I have issues going on with my kids at work. Sometimes I'm worried and thinking about them. Sometimes I'm trying to figure out how to get a lesson across to them. Those things that make you weary, those things that make you burdened. Jesus said, all you have to do is come to him. But some of us won't, some of us won't even seek him. You'll seek coming home, eating a big dinner, watching TV. You'll seek coming home, sitting down, eating dinner, watching Law and Order SVU. Episode after episode after episode after, oh my gosh. I was telling, I was telling Minister Kenyatta earlier uh, when she first got here, she asked me, we were watching Law and Order SVU. And she turned and asked me, she said, have you seen this episode? I'm like, yeah. Next episode comes on. Have you seen this episode? I'm like, yeah. And she looked at me like, have you seen all the episodes? I said, yes, all 21 seasons. And I'm waiting on the next one to come out. But some of us put so much So much of our emphasis on what's on TV. What is this person doing? What is that person doing? I'm going to check Facebook and see what Facebook say. I'm going to check my my horoscope. I'm going to see. No. Maybe what you're looking for is just not wrapped up in God. That's why you can't have any peace. That's okay. Maybe you just don't crave the presence of God. I mean, pastor said if it's it's ouch, it's ouch. You know, sometimes I have an opportunity to minister. I don't even want to say some of the stuff. I'm typing it out and I'm like, Lord, if I say this, sometimes people don't even talk to me after. I mean, come on, Jesus, do do I really have to come across? Yes. Some of you all, what you're looking for is not wrapped up in God. And you wonder why things are the way they are. Maybe you don't crave the presence of God because you don't desire him. Some of us have to have, uh, uh, we want to have a thirst after the worldly things. Now, listen, I may, I may step on some toes, but hear me out. You, you, have a, you have a thirst for worldly good, a thirst for knowledge, a thirst for a pat on the back, a thirst for the key to happiness. I'm not saying that these things are wrong. It's not wrong to want nice things and have beautiful homes and nice cars and money in the bank or to even feel appreciated. But that should not be your ultimate lot in life or your ultimate faith, your ultimate fate. First John 2 and 15 through 17. I'm in the English Standard Version. And thank you, Pastor, for the many weeks you have been coming out of the English Standard Version. I had never really read scripture from this version. It says, this is 1 John 2 and 15. It says, do not love the world or the things of the world. I'll just let y'all think about that. The Bible says, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. The world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Do you hear that? Whosoever does the will of God abides forever. I'm not saying you can't enjoy life. I'm not saying that. But if your ultimate goal is just the things of this world and God is asking us to seek him while we can find him, seek him while we can find him. You know, there's going to be a, a, a time and period where, where, where we won't be able to walk around with our Bibles and, you know, go to church freely. We better seek God while we can. It's not always look at us now. We're having church on a on the internet platform. We can't even we can't even have regular service in our in our buildings because we we're in this pandemic. You better seek them now while you can, while you have life in your body, breath in your body. Matthew five and six says, "Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled." So, what do you hunger for? What are you thirsting for? Psalms forty two and one says, as the deer longs for the streams of water, so I long for you, oh God. Have you ever seen a deer? You know, like, Brother Perry, <laughs> we sit and watch these shows on TV sometimes, and I'm like, why am I watching this? These nature shows. I never would have watched them before. And I'm sitting there looking like, look at this deer. He has no idea what's around him. He wants that water so bad, he drops his head down to that little lake or that pond, wherever he is. And he is trying to get as much water as he can. He's just so thirsty. That's how we have to come after God. That's how we have to seek him. We have to long for him. We have to desire for him. Not to get anything. It's for the relationship with God. Psalm 63 and 1 says, Oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. Early. Early. That's like, like the first thing you do in the morning. Like early. Will I seek thee after you hit the snooze about 15 times? No, before that, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee. My flesh longs for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Water signifies birth and life and represents cleansing and life-giving action of the, and the life-giving action of the Holy Ghost. So in John 7 and 37, it says on the last day the great uh, of the great feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Here we go, going to Jesus again, coming to him again to give us a drink. He says, whosoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his, out of his belly or his heart flows, living, flows rivers of living water. Living water. Oh my gosh, like we can have the living water flowing out of us if we would just seek him, he'll give us a drink. Titus 3 and 5 says he saved us, not because of the righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. And which leads me to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, for by grace have you been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God. It's a gift of God. It's from God, not a result of works so that no man, no man can boast. It's not going to come from man. This salvation is that I'm talking about, it, it can't come from anybody. It doesn't come from anybody walking around down here. It comes from God. God, Jesus died on the cross so that we could have salvation through him. And it's not going to come through your works or how nice you are, how sweet you are to people. You helping little old ladies across the street, six feet apart, social distancing. It's not going to come through all of that. It only comes through faith. You're saved by grace. Amen. So you remember in John chapter 19, I'm just going to take you back. We, like I said, we're kind of all over the Bible tonight. In John chapter 19, verse 32, when Jesus was crucified, and we, we're just talking about water, the significance of water. When Jesus was crucified, that the soldiers broke the legs of the other two that had been crucified. But when they got to Jesus, they went to go break his legs. They couldn't because Jesus had already died. And he was just literally fulfilling the scripture in Psalms chapter 34, chapter 34 verse 20. That, that, that his bones would not be broken and he would be protected. So the soldier, instead of breaking his legs, Jesus' legs, he pierced them in the side. And when he pierced them in the side, blood and water came out of Jesus' body. Well, the blood signifies redemption. The blood came streaming down. Don't we love to sing that on Communion Sunday? The blood came streaming down for me. It was needed to apply uh, to my guilty sins. 
just like in the Old Testament, uh, when there was a sacrificial lamb, a man was slain and its blood applied to the doorpost, okay? And because of that, the death angel passed over. Get it? Pass over. Same with us. When God sees us, if we've accepted Jesus as our Savior, if the blood of Jesus has been applied to our lives, God doesn't see the sin like we're under the blood of Jesus. He doesn't see the sin, but he sees the blood that redeems us. It simply buys us back from the clutches of the enemy. So we talked about the blood. What about the water? Because water came out too when Jesus was pierced in his side. It says the water, the water that came out of Jesus signifies the washing. This is why we, the water is important. The regeneration, to regenerate means to be born again. So the water that came from Jesus' side causes us to be born again or reborn, to live again, and completes what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. He gives us, he gives us that life, the, the, the opportunities to live and to, to flourish and to have success. It comes through God. So I'm telling you that where no water is, there's no life. But in order to get to the water, you got to see God. You can't, you can't bypass and go a different way and be cool and be sweet. You have to come through Jesus. So again, I ask you, what do you have a hunger for? What are you thirsting for? Again, we're back to the same scripture, Psalm 61, 63 and 1. It says, oh God, thou art my God. Early, there's that word again. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee. My flesh longs for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. You know, saints, <laughs> we live in a society. I was, I was telling um, Minister Kenyatta that I, I struggle. I told you all the Lord gave me this, this message a few weeks ago, and I struggled. I said, well, Lord, look at everything that's going on now. Shouldn't I be a little bit more politically correct and kind of talk about what's going on? Look, y'all see what's going on. You all see what's going on. I had to get off Facebook because it's just so much. It can really just affect you. You know, we live in a land that's all dried out. It's all parched. It's thirsty. Okay, you have to understand. I'm not talking about like she thirsty. I'm talking about like thirsty, like dry, no life. Our city is thirsty. Our nation is thirsty. You know, we hear we heard about the senseless death of our uh, young man in Minneapolis. You know, you hear about murder. I often wonder why. Why, why do black people kill black people? Why do cops kill black people? Why do husbands cheat on their wives? Why do wives cheat on their husbands? Why, why, why is it okay for people to take, you know, steal babies and, you know, vandalize property? Why? I'm going to tell you why. Jeremiah 17 and 9, and I'm going to read it in two different versions so you can get a clear understanding. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 in the King James Version says, The heart is deceitful among all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. Now, in the Message Bible, listen to this. It says, the heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful. And we wonder why somebody can put their knee on somebody's neck and they not be bothered by that. It's because the heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful. It's desperately wicked. We are born and shapen in iniquity. And unless the blood of Jesus is applied to our life, we're going to continue to see stuff like we're seeing right now in our society. It, it will. People need to be saved. We say it and it's kind of cliche. Yes, you need salvation. You need the blood of Jesus applied to your life. But in light of everything that's going on, I keep coming back to Matthew 11 and 28. And he says, come to me, all you who are, who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. And I know after you all saw the videos over the past few days and hearing about the, the, um, the young man from Georgia and the young man from New York, you know, it can really weigh you down. It can really just, just get to you. It causes you to have anxiety. You know, you may not want to even go and drive around in the city. You may not even want to just be out. You know, we think about our young black men and you just have concern. But listen, I, I come to tell you, that Psalms 121 says to lift the, you know, lift up my eyes to the hills. Now, listen, Jerusalem was up on the hill, okay? Jerusalem is peace. Me, it means peace, okay? So literally, the, the writer of Psalms 121, he's saying, I will lift my eyes to peace. I will lift up my eyes to peace from what's cometh your help. 
it, it comes from the Lord. It says, my help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. You, you can't be busy looking to the right and the left. I mean, I know it's easy. You may want to, you know, but you can't be focused on what your, you know, what your neighbors are doing. You have to literally get your eyes off eye level. Okay. Colossians 3 and 2 says to set your minds above, not on the things of this earth. I know it's hard. We got, I mean, we got social media, we got laptops, we got iPads, you got Twitter, you got Snapchat. I heard there's a Twitch. I don't know. But there's all this stuff that's out there to get you so focused on what's going on in the land. But God says to set your mind above, not on the things of this earth. Hebrews 12 and 2 says we have to look to Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of our faith. So who better to look to than the person that created you? Who better? You know, Jeremiah 1 and 5 says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, he knew you before. That's who you need to look toward in this time that we're going. And then this dry season, it looks like, you know, it, it may look like this whole Corona thing is up against you. You need to keep your eyes on the Lord. You have to seek him. So what you need, I'm talking about what you're looking for, what you need. Psalms 23 and 1, love this scripture. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. If we just keep that in the forefront, I think we're on the right track. We all know the, the Hezekiah Walker song. And don't worry, I'm not going to sing. Um, we have the Hezekiah Walker song. And it, you know, it's, it, it says, you're all I need. Every breath you breathe through me. You're all I need. Let your rivers flow through me. But it didn't say the money is all I need. Let your breath breathe. No, God, you're what I need. You're who I need to seek after. But you can't get the breath and you can't get the living water and the abundant life without coming to Jesus. You can't sneak in through the back door like I keep saying. You cannot go a different way or be nice or I give to the poor or I gave to the man on the street or I helped the little lady across the street. No, you can only have that breath. You can only have that living water and that abundant life through Jesus Christ. Now, again, I'm not going to sing, but one of my favorite worship bands, uh, it sings this song it calls it's called come to me i'm not gonna sing i don't want y'all to get nervous but simply the song says come to me i'm all that you need come to me i'm everything i'm your anchor in the winds and the waves though your heart and flesh fail you i'm your faithful strength this is talking about who god is i am with you more than you know i am the lord your peace your no evil will conquer you this is this is like god jesus talking to me so I was led to, to, to read Mark chapter four. And in Mark chapter four, Jesus had been preaching at the Sea of Galilee all day, teaching parable after parable. And you know, we know that a parable is a simple story used to illustrate a moral or a spiritual lesson. So many people had gathered by the uh, Sea of Galilee that Jesus ended up you know, taking, you know, teaching from the, the side of the sea. He had to move onto a boat. It was just so many people. So. He was teaching from the boat and he taught them stories from the parable of the farmer scattering seed to the parable of the parable of the lamp to the parable of the growing seed to the mustard seed. So after his all day teaching conference, I mean, can you imagine Jesus had been teaching all day? He finally told his disciples that it's time to cross over to the other side. And you, you can follow me. I'm in, I'm in Mark chapter four. Um, I'm in like verse 34. It says, so in verse 36, they headed out and others followed, followed them. So, you know, just, just know that, you know, if you, if you're hanging around with Jesus and he, he makes a sudden move, people going to follow. If you're doing what God's telling you to do, people going to be watching and following you and trying to see what are you up to. And the Bible says that soon a fierce storm came up. And it's interesting that Jesus would decide to cross the Sea of Galilee, which was known to experience sudden storms due to its low lying position and surrounded, surrounding hills. So I thought it was interesting that, you know, sometimes this dropped in my spirit that sometimes the Lord will take you in a direction that's prone to storms and test your faith. Sometimes. Um, I'm a school teacher. I teach orchestra. Yes, that's a class. I teach orchestra and we give tests. And typically when I give a test, I don't say anything. I'll say, okay, first violins, here are your measures, go. I don't, I don't coach the kids. We don't do anything extra. They play. Now is not the time to ask a bunch of questions. It's not about, it's, you know, I, I can't answer any questions for you right now. Now's the time to see what you're going to do in this test. And that's what God's telling us 
Sometimes he has to put us through a test and he's going to sit back to see what have you learned so far since you've been with me. And here they are in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, in the middle of a storm so intense that the Bible says it was fierce, that it was powerful and destructive. And some of you may be facing a destructive storm tonight. Maybe the heat of the coronavirus has destroyed your house, your finances, your relationships. But the Bible says that the storm was so high and so intense in waves that it be, the waves begin to break into the boat and the boat began to fill with water. And you may be feeling like your boat, um, that your thoughts, your ideas, your dreams are going to sink because of the pressure in the storm. Um, like I said, coronavirus could be your, your storm, lack of funds, being isolated. Some people are isolated from their family. They can't even get to their family. Uh, lack of work, but I'm here tonight to ask you and to tell you that all things work together for good. Okay, that's Romans 8 and 28. All things work together for good. Hallelujah. And and in Genesis 50 and 20, it says um, the intended storm or the intended situation that you set out to harm me, God intended it for it to accomplish what, what he caused it to be. Amen. And the Bible says that while the storm came across the sea and the waves began to speak or began to break, into the boat and began to fill with water. Jesus was sleep, sleeping in the back of the boat. And I looked up where he was sleeping. And in and, and some translations, it says the stern of the boat. That's where Jesus was in the stern of the boat, which is in the rear of the boat. And it's interesting. Listen to this. The disciples were in a part of the boat where the waves were crashing and the water was coming into the boat. But Jesus was in the, in the stern of the boat, which is where water could not get in. I looked it up because I was like, where is the stern and what's its purpose? It, it's in the rear of the boat and it keeps water out of the boat. Jesus was in the stern of the boat where no water could get in. And his disciples were in another part of the boat where the water was crashing in. And it's so interesting. He wasn't just propped up. You know how you come home after church and you're tired and you just kind of sit on the couch and you kind of fall asleep. You didn't really intend on falling asleep. You just kind of fell asleep. You just took a nap on the couch. No, Jesus had a pillow. He was laid out. He was asleep. His head was on the pillow. Read the scripture. It's in there. He had intentions of going to sleep. He had been preaching and teaching all day. All right. So he had a pillow and he went to sleep. And some of you all looking at your situation, you see the thread. You see the boat filling with water. You see your plans drifting away. But did you forget what Jesus said in verse 35? He said, let us pass over to the other side. And the simple fact that he's on the boat too. Some of us are busy trying to fix the problem when all you need to do is trust in the promise maker who spoke to you that you make it to the other side. He said, let us pass over, similar to what I said before about the death angel passing over the household when the blood of the lamb was applied to the doorpost. To pass means to move or cause to move in a specific or a specified direction, to change from one state or condition to another, to die. God is calling us, listen to this. When God dropped us in my spirit, I wrote that thing down. He said, God is calling, calling us to die to our own way, our own thinking, and to move with him in his specified direction. And he wants us to be transformed. And he wants to transform us from one state or condition to another. God is ready for us to change. He's ready for us to transition to the next level. But some of us are always stuck in our old way, married to the old way. But he wants us to die to the old way. And um, uh, Evangelist Bo brought this out a couple of weeks ago in Isaiah 43 and 19, that behold, I will do a new thing. Now shall it spring forth, he said. Uh, he will make a way in the wilderness and rivers. Oh my God, there it is again. Rivers in the desert. Hallelujah, there's water in the desert. I mean, but we just got to let God do the new thing. But instead of trusting the promise that was right there on the boat with them, uh, we, we are called according to his purpose, but some of us can't trust the promise he's given us. Some of us are like the disciples. Look, Jesus, now look, you got me out here. I came out here on the boat with you. You got me out here. You know, I, I don't know about this. And right in the middle of all the chaos, the boat is full of water. I, I, I just, I, I'm going to make a right turn here because some of us need to uh, be in the overflow. Some of us need to let the water crash and hit us. OK, some of us need and when God brought this to me, I was like, Jesus, oh, my God. Some of us, you need to be knee deep, ankle deep and knee deep in water. OK, no stimulus check, you know, for God, for God to give you exactly what you need. God give you exactly what you need. 
I'm reminded of the prophet Ezekiel who received a vision from God concerning the restoration of the land in Ezekiel chapter 47. And in the first part of the, the chapter in uh, just about every scripture, he, uh, the, 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 uh, Ezekiel writes, he brought me back. He brought me out. He led me around. He led me through. And God told him that wherever the water flowed, the land would be healed, that the fish would be replenished, that the trees would grow and not wither, that the fruit would not fail, but the trees will bear fruit every month that the living God will provide power to renew, restore, and resurrect life. So I'm here to tell you that if you allow God to lead you through the deep waters, now see, you still got to seek him though. Don't forget about the initial conversation, like what you're looking for. You still got to seek him. He will lead you through the deep waters of whatever storm you may be facing. He will do anything but fail you. Even though you may feel like God is sleeping on your situation, take comfort that Jesus is on your boat and that my God would do anything but fail you. He'll do anything but leave you. He'll do anything but forsake you. Maybe the disciples thought that uh, about the definition of the word sleep. And, you know, the definition of sleep is a little bit different than slumber. Slumber is like that really light sleep where, you know, if you hear someone open the door, you just, uh, you just automatically wake up. But to sleep is to, to rest in a state of reduced consciousness reduce muscle activity, reduce interaction with surroundings. Like, uh, yeah, like I was sleep a little bit, a little bit ago before Bible study, uh, where you just don't even realize you wake up and you don't even know where you really are. But did they forget that what numbers 23 and 19 says, it says that God is not a man. Did they forget that Jesus said we was going to get to the other side? Like, even though Jesus was sleep, the Bible didn't say he was slumber. He was sleep. Did they forget that he had just said a few moments ago that we're going to get to the other side? The Bible says, Numbers 23 and 19, that God is not a man. That, that could preach itself right there. He's not a man. That he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and, ha and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Isaiah 55 and 11 says that, that so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. That means it's going to do what it's supposed to do. It will accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper to the thing whereunto I sent it. First Corinthians 1 and 20 says, For the promises of God are yea, and in him, amen, and as pastor would say, and it is so. And we sing these worship songs, but do you believe it? It says he's a way maker. I'm not going to sing. He's a miracle worker, a promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. So the promise was right there in the boat. So what you looking for? Are you seeking them? Are you, are you seeking and following hard after him? Oh, but let me tell you, saints, I'm seeking the author and the finisher of my faith who brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. And if, you know, it's interesting, if I can believe that Jesus's blood from 2000 plus years ago can save me, why can't I believe the very word to deliver me? That's two totally different things. I can believe that Jesus can save me, that his blood washed away my sins that I did in 99, 98, 97, like 2002, 2000, all them years I've been alive, that the blood of Jesus can wash away my sins, but I can't believe that God can, can deliver me. I can't believe that God can deliver me out of, this, out of this boat with this water crashing in. I know why you're panicking. I figured it out and it, this hit me hard. I know why I'm nervous. I know why I'm a bit frantic. It's 1 Peter 5 and 8. 1 Peter 5 and 8. And this is the amplified version. It says, be sober, well-balanced, and self-disciplined. Be alert and cautious at all times. The enemy of your soul, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, fiercely hungry, seeking someone to devour. I figured it out. The reason why I don't seek God like I'm supposed to or like I should be all the time is because I'm not sober. I'm not being balanced. I'm not self-disciplined. I'm not alert. I'm caught off guard. And I begin to flip out when the enemy is trying to attack me. Now, if you read the scripture, it says he prowls around alike. Now, I'm no English major, but it didn't say he prowls around because he's a roaring lion. It says he prowls around like, like he has like characteristics, like, you know, he may... Uh, growl like a lion or roar like a lion, but he ain't got no bite like a lion. Uh, he may uh, he may walk in a circle like a lion, but he ain't gonna pounce on me like a lion. 
So I'm over here freaking out over something that's got the attributes, but not even that that's not really a lion. Do you get what I'm saying? So this dropped in my spirit <laughs> and you all pray for me. Okay. So you all know Chris Tucker. He had a saying, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? And I'm here to ask you tonight. Do you believe the word that's coming out of my word? Do you believe the word of God that's coming out of the word of God? When you seek the Lord, he'll tell you things like Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the plans and the thoughts that I have for you, said the Lord. Plans of peace and well-being and not of disaster to give you a future and a hope. But you you flipping out over a little, a little devil roaring like a lion. But Jesus said that he's going to give you a, a expected hope and a, and, a, and a promised future. But how many of you know, if you go back earlier in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, you know, it was from a letter from Jeremiah to the prophet, to the el uh, Jeremiah the prophet, to the elders that were in exile and to everyone that had been taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar from Jerusalem to Babylon. God said, look, now listen to this. God said, look, build your houses and live in them. Plant your gardens and eat their fruit. Get married and have kids all while in exile. Seek peace in exile, and you'll find peace while you're seeking peace. God, oh, that blew my mind. So God wants you to find peace in the midst of the storm. Amen? Listen, back in, in Jeremiah 29, he says, um, I, you know, I don't want you to listen to what everybody else is saying. I don't want you to listen to the false prophecy. God is saying this, and this is to the, to the, the, the people back in, in, in Jeremiah. He says, God will visit you. He will visit you after your 70 years have been completed of exile. Now, all this time, they living. They, they, they getting married. They having kids. They planting, planting fruit, everything. They living. After those 70 years are completed, God said, I will visit you. He said, I will perform my good word, word, my good word, my good word towards you that I will cause you to return to this place. And this place that he's talking about is Judah and Jerusalem. Judah is praise. Jerusalem is peace. So God is saying that when this time of exile has been completed, and I'm talking to us now, God will visit you. God will perform his word that he spoke to you in your life. And God will give you and bring you back to a place of peace and praise. But you're not going to get none of that if you don't seek God. You have to seek him now while he may be found now. Call upon him now while he is near. It's a condition to it. Amen. Let's go on. Jeremiah 29 and 12. And I'm almost done. It says, then you will call on me and you will come and pray to me. This is God talking and I will hear your voice and I will listen to you. How many times have you called somebody and you just talking and they ain't heard a word you said? They, they, they look up and say, huh, what'd you say? God will give ear to you and listen to you. And then in verse 13, it says, then with a deep longing, you will seek me and require me as a vital, absolutely necessary, essential just like, you know, we, we had to go out and shop and they said, you know, get your essential items, your water, your toilet paper, your paper towels, your Lysol. No, you're going to seek God and he's going to be an essential necessity in your life. And you're going to find him. You're going to find him when you search for him with your whole heart. Ephesians chapter five, verse 14 in the Amplified Bible says, for this reason, he says, awake sleeper and arise from the dead and Christ will shine and dawn upon you and give you light. And uh, saints, I just, I just want to say that um, before I turn this back over to pastor, that this is, this is prime time for us right now. I know we've heard a lot of teaching. There's a lot of preaching going on across the air, you know, across internet and social media. And uh, I've heard our pastor talk about revival. And sometimes when we hear the word revival, we think, oh, a five day, five days and we have a speaker and you know what, not, not that kind of revival. I'm talking about a revival of your soul, a revival of your soul. 
where God can, where you take the time and you seek him with your whole heart, not looking to the right or left, but to go, to follow hard after him. I just want to pray with you really quick before I give you back over to our pastor. It, this, this time is so important. God did not give us this time. And I, I just speak to myself. God didn't give me this time to just sit around and do nothing. Yeah, I'm a musician and I play and I like to, you know, what God didn't give me this time to like play, like play, play, like take advantage of having all this free time. God, God to me, for me, he gave me this time to rest and to regroup because I tell y'all right now, life was just busy. Life before the coronavirus and it hits coronavirus hits people differently. I'm not saying that it should hit you the same way it hit me. And I'm not downplaying the people that have lost their lives due to this pandemic. But I, I, I can only tell you from my perspective. When coronavirus hit, I was busy. Work had me busy. Life had me busy. Everything was busy. I leave in the morning to go to work. It's dark. I get home from work and doing all the other things that we do in life and it's dark and it's time to go to bed and do it all over again. My husband says, wow, I just, you just come home and you, you know, we eat dinner and you fall asleep and that's it. And it, it, it just weighs on you. You don't even realize how busy you are until you have a couple days off. And uh, back in March, before everything was locked down, I went on a trip with my high school kids and we came back and it was, it fell right into spring break. It was perfect timing to have that week off. And I told, I told brother Perry, um, while we were coming back, we had a 14 hour ride back home. So I was telling him, I said, I cannot wait to get home and to just rest and to just have some time. I didn't know that what, you know, we would be experiencing, you know, eight weeks of online learning. I didn't know that I wouldn't go back to work and in, in a, in a traditional classroom. And the Lord just showed me that this is time to just rededicate and to just seek him now you know, up early in the morning, praying, up early in the morning, reading, listening to um, preaching and words that, that can uplift you, not just always TV. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying we're walking around here listening to preaching all day. I don't, I'm not going to sit here and lie, but it's, it's time to regroup and it's time to let God have his way in our life. This, this is the revival I'm talking about. And I just want to pray with you. And I, I mean, I really, I mean, just, you can even sit your phone down and I want you to lift your hands. I want you to close your eyes. I don't want you even looking at the screen. I just want you all to just join with me in prayer. Um, just close your eyes. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, first before, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to minister to your people, God. Lord, I just pray I'm praying for the people that are watching right now that you revive us, God, in our spirits, God, that you are renewing us a deeper love for you and a deeper desire for you and the desire to seek you in this season before things get back to what we call what is called normal, God. Help us to seek you the more. Help us to pray and to just sit in your presence, God not asking for anything, not begging you, not inquiring, not anything, just to get into your presence, God. Your word is true in Psalm 16. That's at your right. You know, you give us the fullness of joy when we're in your presence. The sustaining life is in your presence. That peace is in your presence, God. And Lord, I pray that that as we go into the days forward and we move, you know, through our daily life, that Lord, that you would cause us to just put you first. You said in your Bible, in your word, to seek ye first the kingdom of God and your righteousness and all these other things, the other things, because we know that we're going to have other things. You, you know, you knew that we was going to have other things in our life, but if we seek you first, you'll, you'll, you'll take care of those things. If we seek you with our whole heart, not that you're a Santa Claus 
or, 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 or anything like that, but we just come to you wholeheartedly and earnestly with love and compassion to get into your presence and to love on you, God, that you will show us the mysteries of your word, that you'll open up your word to us, that you'll speak to our heart, that you'll give us direction on what we need to do on a day-to-day -day life, in our day-to-day -day lives, God. And Lord, we thank you. We ask that, I ask that you revive every person that's listening right now, that, that starting even tonight before we go to bed, that it's just, I, I, I gotta just, I just gotta pray before I lay down. I just, I just got to read the word before I lay down. I can't continue through, through, through life, just kind of piecemealing it together and, you know, opening my Bible on Wednesday and, and, and just kind of have going on Sunday, but God, I need you every single day and I can't make it without you. I can't make it without you. Not through this desperately wicked world we live in that we, that we know we need you. So God, even as we, as we close this prayer, God, I just thank you for all my brothers and my sisters that are listening right now. If, they're in, if there's anyone listening now that doesn't know you, God, Lord, I pray that you would touch their mind, oh God, that you'll give them a heart to be saved and a mind to be saved. And Lord, we just thank you right now. We thank you for what you're doing in the hearts and the minds of people, God. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you all the praise and all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, just take a few moments and just begin to worship the Lord right where you are. Uh, truly the presence of the 